All right, I'm going to give everybody a brief introduction to XML and TEI. This is for absolute novices, so I'm not using my terms very rigorously. Um, my goal with this is to give you a basic understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how to do it, okay? If you do want to learn more about this, please contact me via email. Um, there's also opportunity for uh, summer research work with me that can be paid for through the university uh, on a project like this. So uh, just a little bit more advanced <laughs> as, as we'll see. But uh, if you are interested, please um, email me, okay? I'd love to work with people who are, who are um, eager uh, to, to do more with this kind of, of project, okay? So an introduction to XML and TEI for absolute novices. So in general, what world are we in? Well, XML is a markup language or syntax that's really just like HTML. Um, it's part of the world of the internet uh, and the world of data that is stored, transported, and then made available on the internet. Okay. But uh, because XML is usually used, at least in our world, um, to talk about texts, things like novels, poems, plays, essays, other forms of writing, like inventory lists, okay, all kinds of different texts, okay, we're also potentially in the world of literary studies or humanities, okay? So digital, searchable, and accessible collections of full texts, kind of like JSTOR, Project Muse, which you might already be familiar with, they are also um, operating in this world of XML. But what is it that we're looking for? So TEI, which I'm going to explain a little bit more fully in a bit, is a very particular kind of XML. Okay? Uh, XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. Um, it's a little bit like hypertext markup language or HTML, uh, which web pages are mostly built out of. Um, almost anything that you look at in your web browser has at least a little bit of HTML in it, though it probably also has other things too. Okay? So XML and HTML are both meta languages. They're languages about languages. So they offer descriptors of content so that your browser or other kinds of software can read, interpret, and display the content in a particular way. Right? So these are descriptors of what you see on the page or on the screen. Okay? If you've ever used Microsoft Word, which we all have, then you have used XML, right? That's what that docx, the x in that file type uh, means. It's x for XML. Uh, if you've ever copied and pasted from a Word document, you might have noticed that there's a lot of gobbledygook in it, um, which you didn't put there. You, we usually don't see it because um, XML is, is there. It's helping the computer display what you've written in a specific way. Usually we don't see it, um, but, but it is in there. It's in the background and it's helping the computer display it for us in the way that we want it to be displayed. Uh, XML indicates things like font face, font size, page breaks, footnote style. It helps make the link between your footnote reference and the footnote content. Everything about the format and setup of your document is, in, is, is described in XML. So here's an essay that I've been working on. And here is the XML. Like it's super complicated looking. We don't need to know, you know, what this means. Um, but I want you just to know that the way that your Word documents come into being for you as a user is because of XML. It's because of that markup language. Okay. So here's an example. Um, this is uh, this is just a bunch of letters, right? How do we know how to read this? Okay. Well. We can look at the letters and we know that the letters are in English, okay, uh, because we have that information. We have those instructions. We know how, we know what English is. We know um, how to recognize it when we see it. Even if this doesn't look like grammatically correct English, right, it certainly doesn't have the right capitalization. There's no punctuation. It doesn't have any of that. The very fact that we can notice that it's in English without having access to any of those other cues is important, right? That means that we have internalized a series of instructions right, that we know how to use. OK, 
Okay, computers need to be taught all of that, all right? So um, we can tell that this is in English. Um, if we look closely, we can tell that this is the first letter of Lady Susan, um, her where she's writing to her um, her her brother, right? Her brother-in-law. Um, we can see some of the key words here, right? It's just missing a whole bunch of stuff. It's missing other things that help us understand how to read it and what it should look like, okay? This is what um, the manuscript of Lady Susan in Austin's hand actually looks like, okay? So you could see that this is a letter, right? It's written on a piece of paper that looks like a letter. Uh, it has a heading up here, letter one, Lady Susan Vernon to Mr. Vernon. We've got a um, information about where it was written and when it was written up here. We've got a salutation, my dear brother, and then we've got the letter itself, and then we've got the signature down here at the bottom, okay? So these are the same things, aren't they? Okay. Then what happens when we put it online, okay? Or we look at it in something like Wikisource, okay? It looks like this, which is very much different from this, right? And it's also very different from this, okay? So we need to be able to systematize this, and that means that the computer needs to be able to understand what each of the parts are of this letter, okay? So that it can display them to us in ways that we might want it to be displayed, so that we can search within it in more robust ways, so that we can do all sorts of interesting analytical things with it um, that are impossible if it's just plain text, okay? How would a computer know without being told what the parts of that letter are, or even that it is a letter, right? Computers are not smart, okay? How is the computer supposed to know that it's meant to be read in a certain way or displayed on your browser in any particular way? Um, it can't, okay? Not without something called structured data, okay? XML is a way of structuring, of giving shape to data so that it can be used in more effective ways. XML is unique though because it allows users to define the way they want to describe their content. And because of this, it's very useful for displaying documents of all sorts of kind, kinds. The X in XML means extensible. That means you can add things to it, okay? So inventory lists, right? poems, blog posts, handwritten manuscripts and letters, JSTOR articles, play or television scripts, music, all of these things can be described in what we call a machine-readable way using something like XML. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of data. It doesn't mean anything in particular to a computer or to the people who are reading it online or engaging with it online. So basically, XML allows you to create a meta-language to help you encode your documents so that machines can read and display them properly. So let me take a little bit of time to explain that. A couple key words to keep in mind here. Structured data, I've used it a couple of times. Structured data is any data that exists in a structured way, usually in a database, okay? Think of a table in a spreadsheet, right? I have several ro rows of information and each row has a label and those labels tell me what the numbers in each of the cells of the tables are supposed to represent. Here's a five, is that meant to be the number of shirts I have <laughs> um, in my uh, warehouse. What is that five? I, I don't know what it's supposed to be. It's just a five, right? Um, markup language is another keyword uh, that I've used before. So a markup language is a way of marking up or annotating in a way that a machine can understand so that the machine can then be taught or told what to do with it, okay? Remember that computers are dumb, especially you know now, right now, they're, they're, they're pretty dumb, even though we have the burgeoning development of artificial intelligence, okay? Computers still need to be told how to do everything. Stuff that's second nature to us, like figuring out that that bunch of gobbledygook that I showed you was English, okay? Or understanding when a word has been misspelled, right, in your native language, all of those are things that a computer has to be given a set of instructions and data in order to understand, okay? So here again, I see that this is in English, but the only reason I see it's in English is because I have internalized the rules that allow me to recognize this as English, okay? I know that it's missing things, right? I know it's missing spacing, but spacing is a, is a tool that we use to help us interpret something.
here's the manuscript again, right? And the letter online, right? And this is what it would look like in XML. Okay, so you see um, that I've got a division head up here. I've got all of this stuff in brackets, okay? Um, and then here I've got the, the letter number and the authorship and addressee information, the place that it was written for, the date, the salutation, my dear brother, right? I can no longer refuse. Da, 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 da. Okay. So over here in this uh, green box, okay, I've, I've put a list of the key parts of a letter that need to be marked up in XML so that a computer can understand what, uh, what these portions are, what they're meant to be, and therefore how they can be displayed or how we might search within them, um, any number of things. Okay? So a div right, is any division of text. Okay, any division of text. A head is a heading. An opener is usual is in a letter, right? It usually has a dateline and a salutation. Right? A paragraph. Uh, a closer in a letter that usually includes a salutation and a signature. And the closing of the div, the whole collection of the text, the division of the text. Okay? I'll tell you a little bit more about the anatomy of this XML file in just a sec, but. But this is what it looks like in XML, okay? So you see here this text, my dear brother, is being described as a salutation, salute, okay? This bunch of text here is being described as a paragraph. That's what the P is doing. And here's the second page with the closer okay, of that first letter in Lady Susan. There are a couple things here that you, that I just kind of want to draw your attention to that I'll, I'll say a bit more about um, in a sec. So here's the closer. Every letter, right, has uh, an opener and a closer, okay? So here's the closer part of the letter. And you'll notice that it, we have these two um, words, closer, um, that are surrounded by brackets, right? Angle brackets. And then the second one has a backslash. Okay? This is just how XML works, the same way HTML works, okay? We have an opening sort of element tag, and we have a closing element tag. And everything that's inside the opening and closing tags is what is part of that thing that you've just described in those tags, okay? So this is the opening tag for the closer. And here's the closing tag for the closer. Here's the opening tag for the salutation. And all of the stuff in here is part of the salutation until we get to the closing tag, okay? Here's this open tag for the signed line, the sign, the signature, okay, it's called signed. Uh, and everything after that and before the closing tag has now been described as a signature. And that way, when, let's say I'm, I want to search for all of the letters that are signed Susan Vernon or all of the letters that are signed Reginald de Courcy, I can now search for that, okay? Because the computer knows what to select from, everything that is within these um, components, okay? There are a few other things you might notice here. One is this LB. See how it has the backslash um, inside it, the uh, the tag there's no closing tag it's it's in a, the, the angle bracket sorry not the angle bracket the uh, backslash is in a different place right it's at the end of the tag and it doesn't have a companion tag it doesn't have a closing line break that's because this is what's called an empty element it doesn't need to surround something right? it just needs to be okay this indicates that there's a line break here okay computer won't know. You hit enter, the computer doesn't know if you were to take that and put it online that that should be a, a, a um, you know, a, a hard return. Okay, you have to tell it that it's a hard return in order for it to always appear everywhere like a hard return. The other thing you might notice is that is this other um, element, again with the backslash here, right, it doesn't have a companion closing tag. It is its own opening and closing tag. Um, this is a page beginning element. So this tells us where the page breaks, okay? Um, the ending of the first page and the beginning of the next page. Okay, this is the beginning of page number 204, okay? I've added this in here. Um, 
if you're interested in helping me with this for the rest of the um, the, the text of Lady Susan, uh, let me know and I can give you some some tasks to do. But basically, we're going to go in, I will go in a little bit later and just put all of the page beginnings in there and number them and link them up to the images that I have, um, which are stored on Amazon Web Services. Okay. So in XML, you can create any kinds of descriptions you want. Okay. Um, just because I call this a closer, right, um, is somebody else could call it something else, right? Uh, that's the X in extensible markup language. Um, I could create, I could, I could encircle this phrase have therefore resolved, right, with um, a, an element that is, has something that, that I just make up, okay? I can call this something. I can surround the word Churchill with, um, with a, a tag that maybe reads location, okay? I can create any number of tags that I want to, okay? I just have to define them in, in another place. Um, but I can create anything. I can create any descriptors that I want in XML. So that is, is, is great, right? Um, but it can also be super chaotic because uh, we need to have standards, okay? We need to be able to know that, that in any XML file um, that is describing a letter, it has a certain set of standards, of features, okay? And we're gonna call them, we're gonna, we're gonna label them in this particular way, okay? So that the person down the street who decides to help out with encoding Lady Susan has the same set of rules, okay? So that's what TEI is. TEI stands for the Text Encoding Initiative. Uh, and they set up a series of rules or syntax for describing text, just like the letter that we saw. The Text Encoding Initiative um, was an organization, it still is actually, it's still in existence, um, of scholars and librarians and computer programmers that came together in 1987 to create guidelines for using XML in a consistent way, right? If it's extensible and you can make, you can create any tags you want on the fly, well, then how are we gonna have um, text that talk to each other or that can be incorporated into a database without going through further regularization, right? We all need to be talking in the same terms. So they've set up um, these guidelines um, and they're called the TEI guidelines. Um, okay, so one thing, you might be wondering why this is useful. Why are we doing this, okay? Uh, there are a lot of examples online, which I encourage you to take a look at, um, that, that have their data marked up in XML. The Old Bailey Online is, um, is a web-based um, uh, project, a digital humanities project, uh, that contains all of the legal proceedings from the Old Bailey, which was London's central criminal court. So all of the legal proceedings from 1674 to 1930 have been digitized and, and, um, and marked up in XML. So you can search for it. So you could do things like search for all of the guilty verdicts in say cases of robbery from 1675 to 1676. You can limit the data and search it in that particular way because it's been marked up like this, okay? When you're researching in the library databases and you search for, say, a keyword in the abstract of a journal article, you are searching structured data because the computer has been told that this chunk of text is an abstract, right? And that I want to search within all those chunks of text that are called abstracts, this one keyword. So the Old Bailey Online is really cool. Um, you can search for all of these different things, victim name, victim gender, judges' names, verdicts, punishments, advertisements associated with it. Um, there's just so many really fascinating things that you can do if you have really good structured data um, and, a, and, and a good portion, a good, a good collection of it, right? Um, you can do all sorts of fantastic things with this information. You can learn a lot of stuff about it. Um, but, uh, but you can't do that in, unless the data has been structured. So this is why Project Gutenberg is sometimes problematic because it's just in plain text, okay? So why might this be useful, right? You could search for innocent verdicts during the early 18th century related to the crime of rape. Right? That might be an interesting question. Right? Um, all sorts of, of things, right, that you can do. 
you could compare the 1712, the 1714, and the 1717 editions of Pope's Rape of the Lock side by side on your computer screen. Right? Um, you could search for and then graph language changes in all novels written in English over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, right? as we can see here. Okay, um, So there's a lot of stuff that you can do with XML, and we are only getting into a tiny little bit of it. Okay, so the key features of TEI, a couple key features that you want to keep in mind, you always have to use an opening and a closing tag um, in your XML. Sometimes they're smooshed together, like those line breaks or the page beginning tag that I showed you. Okay, um, Those are called empty elements, like this one, BR. This is just um, a single line return, a break of some sort. Okay, You're not surrounding text that you're describing as a paragraph, rather you're inserting a thing itself. So this is what's called an empty element. Okay, so the line break, um, oh sorry, this is this is reversed, isn't it? Um, sorry, this this slash should be at the end. Sorry about that. Um, I that's a that's a typo. Um, I need to correct that. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to redo this whole this whole presentation though. Sorry. So I hope everybody got that. This br should be should have that um, that slash at the end of it in order to be an accurate and and you know a, a real empty element. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, but these open and close tags surround the text that those tags describe. They're sometimes called elements. All right. Tags can be nested, but they have to be nested properly. Okay. So for instance. Um, here is a uh, opening tag to a paragraph, and here's the closing tag to a paragraph. But if inside that word nested, I need I wanted to mark up in another way, I have to be sure that I'm nesting it appropriately. Okay, so this element rs type equals explanation has to then be closed before I can close the paragraph. Okay? So there's a certain order: open tag open tag, close tag, close tag. Okay, they're nested. Tags are also case sensitive. Please remember this, okay? Tags can be further defined by letters, sorry, by attributes, okay? So this element, div is the element, type is the attribute. Element, div, type, attribute, okay? So um, P is an element, okay, element. But I can give that element an attribute. Right? Often these attributes are type attributes or number attributes. Most TEI documents contain key parts. There's an overarching opening descriptor that says, hey, the, the thing you're looking at is this thing called TEI. <laughs> there is a header usually that has lots of metadata about the document we're looking at. Um, ours is going to need to have TEI header information as well, but uh, I'll deal with that later. And then that's closed. Then in any text, you might have a you might have front matter like a table of contents or something like that if you're digitizing a book. And then you have the body of the text, okay, which is then closed. And then you might have any back matter like say an index, okay. And then you close the document itself, and this is the very last thing you see, just like the opening TEI tag is the very first thing that you see. TEI files can become super complex, but we are going to be using a very, very simple set of markup guidelines for our project. Okay, um, Each individual or team will have certain letters to work on. Uh, be sure to talk with your teammate if you have questions. They can help you work through your questions, and I'm always available as well. If you like, you can choose to divide up your team's letters to work on individually, or you can work together on them. We're going to be using Google Docs to do this. Okay. We're going to be marking up the letters with only the following tags, div, opener, dateline, place name, date, salutation, and then paragraphs, and then closers closing parts of the letters, uh, which have a salutation and a signature line in them, and then we're closing everything with a div. Okay. If you notice or if you think about incorporating anything like this, anything that's, anything that's in all caps is meant to be italicized. Okay, That's 
how Project Gutenberg indicated italics. Okay? Um, so anything that is in all caps, if you choose to do so, you can mark that up with um, with italics, okay? And that's the tag you use, hi rend equals italics. Just be sure that you lowercase everything, okay? Well, you know, title case everything. If you're interested in doing this and you have questions, email me, okay? Um, I'll be adding all the other necessary tags, so don't worry about anything, okay? Those are the only ones you need to worry about. So take a look at Canvas. Uh, take a look at the assignment and an overview of the website where our version of Lady Susan will appear. Um, the videos are in Canvas right under Announcements. There's a tab called Videos. Okay. So what you're gonna be marking up are large, oh, this is incorrect. Here we go. What you're gonna be marking up are um, large textual divisions, the letter as a unit. Um, div n equals whatever the number of the letter is, and then type equals letter. You're also going to be marking up smaller textual parts within the letters, the heading text, the opener and closing portions of the letter, right. each paragraph, and anything that it should be in italics. So here are some in here's some examples, okay? The heading text, number one, Lady Susan Vernon to Mrs. Johnson, would be marked up like this. Open head type equals sub. And then here's number one. I've added a line break just to help clarify things. Um, HI rend equals italics, Lady Susan Vernon to Mrs. Johnson. Close the, the um, highlighting element and close the header element. Okay. Openers, every letter has an, has an opener and a closer. Inside each opener, you have a date line and a salutation. Inside each date line, you will most likely have a place name and a date. In some of the letters, you don't have a date. I think the very first one definitely has a date, but not very many of the other ones do. Um, but you're almost always gonna have a place name, okay? Um, this tells you where the letter was written from, and that's actually usually in the, the letter itself, okay? Um, and then you have a salutation, so dear mother, right? My dear brother, right? to whom it may concern, that's called the salutation. And then every letter also has a closer with a salutation, right? Something usually in the 18th century is very florid like this, your most obliged and affectionate sister, right? <laughs> um, sincerely is one we use today, a salutation that we use today. And then a signature line, right? S. Vernon. Again, see how this is in all caps? That's because Project Gutenberg indicated italics with all caps, okay? So I'm gonna have to go through and change all of that, which is really annoying, but whatever. Um, and then be sure to wrap the whole of the letter in the div tags, okay? Each, paragraphs, each paragraph in P tags as well. As you mark things up, like I said, we're gonna be working on uh, the Google Docs um, uh, link in our shared drive. We're going to be working on that for this project. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. As you're working on your letters, I encourage you to highlight anything that seems strange so that you can ask questions and anything that um, you think might be interesting for an annotation. Okay. Um, feel free to highlight things. Feel free to add comments in the Google Doc if you want to do that instead. Um, just be aware that, uh, you know, I'll be checking it, and if you have a question, I can I can answer it, okay? So use the comment features to help you um, with your work in the Google Doc. Okay. Here are the teams. Some people had signed up. Some people did not. Those people who did not sign up, I put in brackets because I basically assigned you a team, okay? Um, so these are the team numbers. We have eight teams. Um, they're mostly two or three people, mostly two people with the exception of one group that has three people in it, okay? Uh, so group number one um, will be working on these letters. Okay, you're only you should read, of course, the whole entire, you know, Lady Susan, but you're only gonna be responsible for doing the XML of these five letters, okay? Now, um, I've tried to divide the letters up as equitably as possible based on the length of the letters. So that's why, for instance, group number four only has two letters. These are super long letters, okay? Um, uh, you can choose to divide up the letters that you want to work on so that you can do it individually, um, or you can work on them together as a group, okay? So for instance, um, 
uh, Felipe could work on letter eight, Naya could work on nine, Kyashu could work on 10, Felipe and that, or, and then both every, but all members of the group work on 11 and 12 together. Okay. You can make a, you can make an executive decision amongst your group how, to, how you want to handle that. Okay. If you are interested in learning more, let me know. Um, I'd like to be able to add some more details to our XML. Okay. Um, let me show you our Google Doc. Okay, that is in our shared drive. So here's the Google Doc. I've already done some work with marking this up. All right, this is where you're gonna go. And this is available for everybody to edit. Um, and basically all you do is, cre is add your, um, your tags in the way that I've done to your letters, okay? I do have um, a video walkthrough, which is here. Um, I will just post this link uh, for you to watch at a later time. Uh, this presentation is already getting a little bit long, um, but essentially um, this is meant to, it's not meant to be overwhelming. Um, it's just meant to give you a bit of a sense of how to work with structured data in some minimal way so that we can understand why it might be useful for uh, marking up literary texts. We're going to do a little bit of work later with annotations. We're going to create annotations that will also be an XML, but we're at first step is just basic markup of your letters. Okay. That's going to be due by Monday, April 6th. What I'm going to ask everybody to do there is to submit the group Google doc as your assignment through canvas. So everybody will be uh, submitting the exact same thing, but I need you to actually submit that canvas, sorry, that, um, that Google doc link, so that I have an easy way to keep track of grades, okay? It also just helps me know that you're out there, right? <laughs> Since I haven't seen you in so long uh, and I miss your faces, okay? All right, let me know what questions you have and I look forward to seeing what you come up with.